I'll tell you what, Jody uh, has been in Mississippi this weekend preaching at a uh, uh, revival, preaching at a camp meeting. Uh, he and Glenn, and that's actually, I think, his family's uh, camp meeting, but I feel like I'm preaching at camp meeting here at Mount Bethel this morning. <laughs> what, a, what a moving time. For those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Jonathan Lawson. I'm part of the pastoral team here. And I uh, just want to tell you how thankful I am to have you here, whether you're online or in the room worshiping with us. And today, whether you're in the room or online and joining us in this moment or maybe at some point, some moment in the future, today what I want us to look at, I want to lead us in a conversation with Scripture about what it means and what it looks like to be in the middle, in the middle of a story in the middle of a journey, in the middle of a process. The middle can be kind of a messy and chaotic place, can it? When you're right there in the middle, there's a, a thing that has ended, there's something behind you, there's something ahead that is beginning, but you're right there in the middle. Yesterday, my wife Lindy and I uh, took a step, we've long overdue, to clean out our garage. I'm one of those folks that um, I tend to be a little bit of a pack rat, and especially over the last couple of years with COVID and supply chain shortages, you know, I, I held on to every little scrap of lumber and every extra bolt or nut. You know, you never know when a, a about 18 inch length of two by four may come in handy. <laughs> you know, and so we stick that back there with the uh, six inch by three foot piece of plywood and the uh, 18 inches of copper pipe and all those important things that you know you're gonna need one day. And so yesterday, after uh, about two years, we finally said, look, we gotta do something. And so we backed the cars out and you know, you know the process. You take everything and you move it out into the driveway. And as it happened, there were some folks in our neighborhood who were having a big garage sale. And so all day we had folks stopping and wanting to come up and said, no, 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 it's, it's down and to the right. Uh, we're just throwing things away. But hey, if you want some of this lumber, feel free to take it with you. We didn't have any takers. I'll also admit to you that I'm the kind of person that I get revved up to do a project and I get started and I get going and uh, about halfway through, I run out of steam. And I'm just like, okay. I said to Lindy, I said, okay, where's, where's the other group of people that are gonna come and finish this job for us? And the thing about that kind of process where you pull everything out and you get the blower and you're blowing out all the dust and cobwebs, everything's out there in the driveway you really can't stop at that point, can you? You're right in the middle and it's a big mess. And so we ended up taking a whole truckload to the dump and, and putting uh, everything else back in. It's a lot more organized, it's a lot better. It, it, it's also journeys and, and, and travel can be like that as well. And, and as I was thinking about this, I remember back one of the first trips that Lindy and I ever took as a married couple, we, uh, we decided that we were gonna go to the Chesapeake Bay area of Virginia. And we, we, uh, this was back in the days, the early days of the internet. You know, back before we had GPS navigation, you would print off your directions from MapQuest. Does everybody remember MapQuest? And uh, also in the days before we all had cell phones. I mean, there were cell phones, but we didn't have cell phones. And uh, so anyway, we were gonna go, and this was gonna be not only our first trip up there to Virginia, but it was gonna be the first time that I ever pulled a camper. We borrowed her, her grandfather's camper, and this is gonna be the first time that I ever pulled a camper. So right off the bat, you're probably suspecting where this story goes, right? I'll spare you the details, which include getting lost in Raleigh, uh, having our plumbing ripped out from underneath uh, in a parking lot, and then spending the night in a tobacco field. Um, but after a couple of days of driving, we finally arrived at the KOA campground on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay that we had been dreaming about. We were gonna go crabbing and we were gonna you know, look locally and find some place that maybe we could you know, charter a sailboat. We were gonna just enjoy the beauty of the bay and we got there and I'll say it must have been a lovely place at one time. Um, but as we pulled through the gates and the grass was growing as high as the fence, there were only about three sets of campers there and they all just sort of stared us down with this empty, hollow look as we drove by. And, and the hostess, who I'm sure was a, a lovely lady, 
she just sort of appeared out of nowhere and uh, led us into the locked and unlit uh, office to check us in amidst dusty shelves that were practically empty, a a few uh, cans of beans and packs of matches and things like that. And we knew pretty quickly that this place didn't have a coastal feel at all. In fact, it looked like it was more nestled in a deep, dark wood. I mean, it was all the makings of a great horror movie. And so we stayed there all of five hours before we got back on the road and we drove as long as we could until I was falling asleep. And the next day we made it to Orlando and Walt Disney World's Fort Wilderness Resort. And we had a great week. But, you know, in the middle of that trip, when we got to that place that we thought was going to be this great uh, adventure, this exciting time, it was really turning out to be more like a nightmare. Sometimes that's the way being in the middle can, uh, can strike us. Last week when uh, Dave Rhodes was here and, and he was talking to us about being overcomers, what it looks like to overcome those challenges, he said, he said something that really struck me, it really stuck with me. Uh, Dave, as I said, has an incredible way of, of, of phrasing things and communicating truth in a powerful way that penetrates. And he said this, he said, oftentimes we're so busy building monuments from great moments with God when God is calling us to create movements. The past is meant to fuel the future. And as I thought about this idea of building monuments, I thought about the ultimate in the middle moment, the ultimate monument building moment, which occurs in the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel. It's the transfiguration of Jesus. And if you think about it, it is a a really odd story. It's a really oddly placed within this narrative of the gospel. But there's significance to that, and I think great meaning to us today here at Mount Bethel as we think about what it means to live in the middle, to be in the middle of a, of a story, in the middle of a journey, in the middle of a process. Now, before we, we get into chapter 17, and we're going to be reading the first 13 verses, so I invite you to go ahead and get your Bibles out, go ahead and turn there, but I also want to ask you to write down a couple of other verses. These are all in Matthew and they, they're, they're, we're going to talk a little bit about them and how they connect. And they're going to help to sort of frame up the overall narrative arc and the place where this story of the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17 fits and why it is so impactful and so important. So there's three that I want to give you that you're going to kind of link together. The first three are chapter 3, verse 2, chapter 4, verse 17. And chapter 16, 21. So they should be on the screen. Yeah, 3, 2, 4, 17, and 16, 21. So I want you to think about those kind of being linked together. And we're going to talk about that. And then the second set, there's two of them. It's chapter 3, verse 17, and 17, 5, which we're going to read as part of our passage in just a moment. So 3, 17, and 17, 5. Now what I want you to know about these first three verses is they have an overlap, a verbatim overlap with one another. So 3, 2, and 4, 17 have a verbatim overlap. In 3, 2, it's talking about John the Baptist coming, preaching in the wilderness. And what is he preaching? He is preaching, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's the NLT. Whatever your translation says, however it's different, whether it's the ESV or the NIV or the KJV, whatever V it is, if you look at verse 417, it says that from that time on, Jesus came preaching, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Whatever translation you have, it is verbatim exactly the same message because in the original Greek, it is verbatim the exactly, same, exactly the same message. That is not a mistake. That is not a coincidence. That isn't random chance. It is intentional to communicate something very important that Jesus and what he is bringing is the fulfillment of the old covenant. John is the last prophet of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, Jesus is the New Covenant, the New Testament, and he is bringing the fullness of what was. He is not overturning it, he is not rejecting it, he is not, but he is fulfilling it. 
And there is a continuity between God's plan from all time right down into eternity. And Jesus is the fullness of that. Then you see an overlap between 417 and 1621. And it says in 417, from then on, Jesus began to preach. And in 1621, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples. And so what these indicate are a marker of transition. It's a pivot point when you move from one major movement of the narrative to the next. The first three chapters of Matthew plus those first 16 verses of chapter 4 are the preparation It's the preparation, it's Jesus' genealogy, his birth, the flight to Egypt, the coming of John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism, his time in the wilderness, and then he begins his earthly ministry with the words, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We move through the proclamation then of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus proclaims this message, preaching and teaching, performing healings and miracles and alternating that, beginning with the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps the greatest sermon ever preached, the greatest teaching ever taught. And then he works it out, he lives it out through miracles and healings, right up into the moment that he takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, a place of deep pagan worship, where Peter makes the first confession of Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus turns and it says, from that time, Jesus began to tell his disciples it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. He would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders and the leaders, leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he'd be raised from the dead. And so now we move past the proclamation and towards the passion of Jesus and his gospel. And so the very first thing that happens in this third major movement as we begin to move towards the cross and the redemption of all humanity through the cross of Jesus Christ, the first major event we have is this story in in chapter 17, verses one through 13. And so I invite you to turn there now as we begin to read. It begins by saying six days later. So six days after these events where where, where Peter confesses Jesus, Jesus instructs his disciples. You remember that Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, no, 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 you can't be killed, you can't suffer. The Messiah doesn't do that. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, right? You're tempting me to take an easier path. It's six days after this, six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and he led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud, a bright cloud, A bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Then his disciples asked him, why did the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus replied, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, but he wasn't recognized and they chose to abuse him. And in the same way, they will also make the Son of Man suffer. Then the disciples realized he was talking about John the Baptist. Now, before we we talk about the importance and the impact and the significance of this passage to us today, I don't want us to miss the theological significance that these words hold. The fact that Jesus is revealing himself, when it says that he is transformed, his appearance, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes like with, with bright bright and white as light, and that Moses and Elijah appear here, 
This is a few things. First of all, it reveals the eternal divinity of Jesus. You, there are people, there have been always since the beginning, but there are people today who will claim that somehow Jesus was elevated to the status of Godhood, that he was adopted as a son of God because of his obedience to God's will and God's commands. But that is not what our historic faith teaches. That is not what the scriptures teach, and it is clearly not what is supported by these scriptures here. It's an odd thing, isn't it, that right in the middle of the story, right in the middle of the story, Jesus pulls back the curtain of his humanity to reveal the fullness of his divinity in an overwhelming way. It doesn't, if you think about it, 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 in one way, it doesn't make a lot of sense. He hasn't been to the cross yet. He hasn't been resurrected yet. And yet, he is revealing to these few, these chosen few, the reality of who he is. This establishes this for, for us that Jesus' divinity was already there. It was not something attained in his obedience. It wasn't something that he was given in the resurrection because of his, his uh, glorious death. It was always there from the beginning. In fact, it even ties further back because the next thing we see here in um, verse 5 is this voice from the bright cloud that says, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. Now your translation again may say, this is my beloved son in who I'm well pleased. Listen to him. But whatever it says, however it's written, verbatim, go back to chapter three, verse 17. As Jesus comes out of the waters of baptism, you hear the exact same words come from above. It is the voice of the father identifying the son and telling everyone and Jesus reminding him who he is. Now think about it. If we said that the transition from the preparation to the proclamation doesn't happen until 417, that means that at 317, Jesus hasn't begun his earthly ministry. He's not preached a sermon. He's not performed a public miracle. He has not healed anyone. He has been preparing. That is all. He's done nothing to merit any kind of accolade, and yet in this moment, the father says, this is my son whom I love, in him I'm well pleased. Why is that? Because the father's love and approval is not conditioned upon performance. Let me say that again. The father's love is not conditioned, and his approval is not conditioned upon performance. We live in a performance-based society. And oftentimes we import that into the church and into our religion where we want to say that if I do good, if I do right, then God will love me and reward me. And it is true that if we live according to the precepts and the commands of the Lord and his word, that we will find that our lives align with the design of the universe. But the, but the Lord's approval and love is not conditioned upon our performance because if it would, we would be doomed. We can never perform up to the standard of perfection. It is in Christ alone, in who he is, and in what he has done, that we find salvation, redemption, restoration. It is the merit of Christ, not our merit, that saves us and brings us back into perfect communion with the Father. And so we learn that from this passage that Jesus is the eternal son of God and that it is in him and him alone that we are able to have communion with God. The other thing that's significant here is we see appearing with him who? Moses and Elijah. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the law and prophets. Again, just as Jesus is the fulfillment of that Old Testament message to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, there's a continuity there, a fulfilling of that prophecy. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the law and all the prophets represented by Moses and Elijah there with him. So this is a deeply significant and theologically important passage for us to understand as it pertains to who we are in God, who we are in God through Christ. But as we think about how we apply it to where we are today and what it means to live in the middle, because again, this is a story that happens uh, or a passage that happens in the middle of the story. We've not gone to the cross. We've not gone to the empty tomb. We haven't seen the resurrection, the ascension. 
We haven't seen the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is smack dab in the middle of the gospel. What is going on here? We see this incredible revelation of who God is, of of who Jesus is, his divinity. And Peter, who is one of the witnesses, sees this amazing, wonderful, exciting event. And what does he want to do? He just wants to celebrate, doesn't he? He just wants to to celebrate and he wants to stay right there. He wants to, as Dave said last week, he wants immediately to begin building monuments to what this moment means, right? I mean, I, I just told you everything this moment means and Peter realizes this. It's dawning on him. He is beginning to get it. He's just, just a Just six days before, he's confessed Jesus as the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And now he sees this. I'd be pretty pumped too, wouldn't you? Like, what is going on? We've We've got to celebrate. It's incredible. But both the Father and Jesus say, no, no, come on. We got to keep moving. We got to keep going. We got to go back down. Now, you see, that seems kind of strange to us, doesn't it? Here, Peter's having the original mountaintop moment, right? You know that, that in our culture, in our, culturally, our collective cultural uh, paradigm, in our thought world, this idea of mountaintop moments, this, this is where it comes from. This is it. This is the origin, this mountaintop moment. And Peter just wants to stay there. He wants to build these tabernacles, these tents, these shelters, and just bask in the glory. But Jesus says, no, we're gonna go. We're gonna go back down into the valley. We have those mountaintop moments, right? Those experiences that, that, that we celebrate, and rightly so, because they are significant, they are amazing, they are incredible, and they are the, fu- they are the fuel for the future. But when we think about mountaintop moments, We think about something that might look like this image here. I want to show this image. The beauty, the glory, the grandeur, right? A long hike, a long climb up to the precipice, standing, looking out over all of that creation, looking down over the valley. It's majestic. It's moving. But what do you also notice? That rocky outcropping is barely large enough for a handful of people. And aside from a couple of scraggly pines, not a lot grows up there. Contrast that with the valley. The valley is the place where the rivers run, where the crops grow, where society flourishes, where life is lived. Life is lived in the valley. We have those mountaintop moments and we want to stay there, but there's nothing to sustain us. We meet with God there, but if we are going to continue on with God, then we have to descend back into the valley. Now, some valleys are deep and dark, I know, but other valleys are full of life. They're full of water that flows, that brings life. They're they're full of the work to be done to build. So think about mountaintop moments. I think about Think about that, that moment where, after so many decades, the Georgia Bulldogs finally pull off a national football championship. And, and, and the team storms the field, right? It's, it's, just a, it's, just, it's this chaotic, beautiful, glorious celebration that every single one of us celebrate. Right, Brian? Or maybe, maybe you had the experience in high school, you know, the same high school football, state championship, the lights of Friday night are bright and glowing. And everybody in that moment, everything seems right. But here's the reality is you can't stay there in that moment. Because in a half an hour or an hour, you're going to have to go and strip off the pads. You're still dirty and sweaty and you smell bad and you're going to have to get a shower. And before long, you come out and the crowds have gone away and the lights have gone off. And as great and glorious as that moment was, sometimes you might be left thinking, is that it? Is that all? Is that as good as it gets? Because you can't stay up on that mountain. You gotta come back, you gotta keep going, and you gotta live. See, the first thing is that that, that moment, it will, it will fade. 
Now, maybe you know somebody who's trying to hold on to the past, who, who can't let go of the glory days, right? Maybe you know somebody like Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite, right? Back in 82. You got to let it go. Because the past is not, it's not there to sustain us. The past is meant to fuel the future. And honestly, the glory days a lot of times weren't as great and glorious as we think they were. But even if they were, even if they were this mountaintop moment with Jesus transfigured and the full revelation of the fulfillment of the law and prophets coming right in front of us, Jesus is saying, okay, now you understand, let's go forward. Because what happens when they come down is they come down and immediately there is a young boy who is possessed of a demon and the disciples who stay behind are unable to do anything with him and Jesus prays over the boy and frees him and releases him of this bondage. There is work to be done in the valley. That's where life is lived. That's where the work is done. Fueled by the glory of the mountaintop moment. Sometimes that moment in the middle it might leave you feeling a little empty. Like mine and Lindy's trip to the Chesapeake, where we got there and we had such high hopes and it ended up leaving us hopeless. Is this what we've waited for? I mean, it's great and all, and we're glad to be on vacation and it's wonderful to be together, but is this as good as it gets? Maybe that's where you are in the middle moment. But whether, whether you're trying to hold on to that glory and you think that I just want to stay here in this moment or whether you're thinking, is this as good as it gets? In either case, if we don't move on, we're going to miss out on what lies ahead. You know, think about another travel story, another vacation years later when we, uh, we, we traveled down to the Florida Keys. And if, if you've never been to the Florida Keys and you, you plan to, I would highly recommend that you do it in this way because it was just, it was such a progressive revelation, if I can use that theological term. We, we drove down through Tampa and, and, and down the, the southwest coast of, of Florida and across Alligator Alley. That's the section of Interstate 75 that runs through the, the um, Everglades. And uh, we drove through there and, and we stayed our first night there in Homestead, Florida, down just outside of Miami. And then the next night we, we stayed for a couple nights in Key Largo. And while we were there, we went out to John Pennekamp State Park and went on this boat and, and snorkeled on the reef there and all the tropical fish in this crystal clear blue water. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. And, uh, and we really enjoyed that. And then the, the, a couple nights there, and then we went on down to Marathon and Isla Morada, and finally, eventually, to Key West. And here's the thing, is that as beautiful as Key Largo and the Upper Keys are, as you progress along the overseas highway, and you, you, you cross the seven-mile bridge, and you see all of this, it almost seems like another world. If you just stayed in those Upper Keys, as beautiful and as wonderful and as they were, there's so much more that you would miss out on because you haven't gone the full distance all the way to mile marker one. And that's, that's the journey that we're on. That's the journey that God calls us to go on with Christ, that if Peter and James and John were allowed to build those tabernacles and stay on that mountaintop, just imagine. Imagine if Jesus had said, okay, Peter, you're starting to get it. You understand I'm the fulfillment of the law and prophets. You're overwhelmed. You want to celebrate. Let's do, let's do a touchdown dance. You know, let's celebrate this. Go ahead. If they had stayed right there on that Mount of Transfiguration, they never would have made it to the resurrection. Because they had to come down that mountain to go through the valley, to continue to preach and teach, to, to head towards Jerusalem so that the Son of Man could suffer many things at the hands of the religious leaders so he could be crucified, dead, and buried, and on the third day, raised from the dead. Don't settle for transfiguration when resurrection awaits. As glorious as it is, don't settle for transfiguration when resurrection awaits. So we live in the middle we live in the middle between the first and the second coming of Christ. We live in the middle of the coming of the kingdom and the consummation 
of a kingdom. We live in the middle of two resurrections, the particular resurrection of Jesus Christ and the general resurrection of all things through Jesus Christ. We live in that middle and at times it can be messy, it can be chaotic, like so much garage fodder spewed out and strewn out all over the driveway. At times it can be glorious, like a mountaintop transfiguration experience that we just want to plant our flag and stay right there. But the thing about being in the middle is we can't stay there. We're being called further. We're being called beyond to that ultimate resurrection moment. I kind of think of it in this, these terms too, that it, our culture, we tend to revel in the glories of war. We love the, the war stories. We love war movies. We love those kind of novels and books. And we love to revel in the glories of war. But the thing is, is the peace lasts much longer. And the peace is where the greater glory lies. The peace is where the greater work resides that must be attended to. I think of the famous quote from C.S. Lewis who talks about how we are half-hearted things. That we're like ignorant children content making mud pies in the slum never knowing what it is to have a holiday by the sea. We're far too easily pleased. We experience the mountaintop moments of life and we just wanna sit and stay there never knowing, never realizing that what God has for us ahead is so much greater. There's a greater life ahead. And rather than pursuing more of the same, we wanna begin to pursue that life. Immediately before chapter 17, just those few verses, verses 24 through 26 of chapter 16. This is when Jesus again is instructing his disciples what he must do. And, and Peter says, no, you know, this could never happen to you. And Jesus says, look, get behind me, Satan. You're dangerous. You're setting a trap for me. And then he tells his disciples, if any of you who wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? So what Jesus is telling us is that we've got to loosen our grip as wonderful as those mountaintop moments may be, they're just in the middle. They're just in the middle. We've got to loosen our grip and lay those down so that we can go with him. We're going to walk back down that mountain and we're going to see miracles change lives. We're going to see people delivered from all kinds of bondage. And ultimately, we're gonna see the glory, not of a transfigured Christ, but of a resurrected Christ. And we're gonna share in that glory with him. So this is the call to action for us today. Maybe you're living in that mountaintop moment. Maybe it's been a long time ago. Maybe it's been very recent. Celebrate it. Enjoy it, but understand that it is the fuel to propel the future as you walk with Christ, as, you're, as a follower of Christ, as a leader of disciples in your home, and as a part of the body of Christ moving forward with him. Maybe you're down in that valley. Maybe in your, you're in the messy, chaotic middle. And you're saying, is this it? Is this as good as it gets? Don't try to hold on to those mud pies when Jesus is inviting you to have a holiday by the seashore. 
He's inviting you, calling you to come along with him. And there will be mountaintop moments and there will be valleys to walk through. There will be celebrations to be had and there will be work to be done. But through it all, he is the one who moves us, who leads us, and who calls us on to those greater things. So today, whatever it is that you're holding on to, release that and lay hold of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you in the middle, in the middle of time, in the middle of the story. But Lord, we pray that by your grace and by your spirit, we would remain in the middle of your will. That you would move us along the path, that we would never fall behind, that we would never move ahead of your perfect timing and your perfect place. But move today, fuel a future where we're in the middle of your will to realize the glory of your resurrection. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.